Chapter 4 The Coriobantic Chicken Caper Speaking of old Sonny, the country preacher was saying, you're not going to believe who we ran into at the mercantile today. Well, said Deacon Enos, you tell us who you ran into at the mercantile today and we'll tell you whether or not we believe it. Jimmy Bavaca. Yes, said Deacon Enos, youth pastor who lasted about a month, guy who always wore a denim suit. Yes, except now he wears a white robe and a beard and calls himself Prophet Elijah. Come again, here's his business card. Deacon Enos read it out loud. Jimmy Bavaca, messenger to the church of Laodicea, whose coming is after the spirit and power of Elijah. Sounds like one of them Bronhamites, said Deacon Elmer. It sounded like a Bronhamite, said the country preacher. It sounded like Mooneyism. It sounded like nothing I ever heard before. Imagine my surprise when he says, I used to be a minister in your church. I was a youth pastor for a while. I looked at him for the longest time and couldn't recollect him until he gave his name. He's going gray now. He tried telling his doctrine to me, rattling off scriptures like machine gun fire. I couldn't quite pinpoint it. It's a new doctrine and a category by itself. So I invited him to the courtroom. The courtroom, said the elders gravely. This was the weekly meeting of the elders at the Charismatic Baptist Bible Tabernacle, nestled in the hill country of Five Points in southernmost Gwinnett County. The courtroom was a semi-regular feature of the country preacher's radio broadcast in which he would give his pulpit to some heretic, compromiser and apostate for 10 minutes, then deliver a 48-minute rebuttal. Like the Wittenbergers of old, rural Baptists love this sort of thing. The preacher would lure heretics into his lion's den with the offer of 10 minutes of free and uninterrupted airtime on his three-station radio syndicate. Not many were willing to avail themselves of this opportunity, the more so because the preacher stood six foot nine and his pulpit was built proportionally so that anyone else standing behind it looked like a child. The preacher had manufactured it himself in the early days of his pastorate, after the first one was demolished by an especially thunderous Bible thump. Built in the style of a crate with two by eight planks, it was the ugliest pulpit anyone had ever seen, but of cunning acoustic craftsmanship. The top was a square of plywood held in loose slots and resting on a snare drum. Audibility was enhanced by two rows of four-inch holes in the shape of a cross. A pulpit top would last anywhere from six months to a year and a half. When it cracked under his mighty fist, it could easily be slid out and replaced with one of the spares stored below. When the preacher delivered a sermon series about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah and started receiving death threats from Sodomites, he lined the inside of his pulpit with bulletproof steel. The frontal steel plate had to have two rows of four-inch holes bored through it because sound quality could not be compromised. Oh, Jimmy Bavaca, said Deacon Rufus, I can't believe this is the same guy who taught Bible with a cowhide in his hand and made Luther Buckenstein sit in the corner with the dunce cap on his head. Those are strange days when Luther was here, said Deacon Elmer. We went through about 30 youth pastors in five years. They ate Jimmy alive, said Deacon Rufus, turned every Bible study into pandemonium. He started out with big dreams, said Deacon Elmer. Like any young feller right out of seminary, he thought he was going to set the world on fire. Remember when he first got here, he had that big banner made that said, Youth on Fire? He thought he was going to bring in every kid in the town and fill the sanctuary and have a big old-fashioned youth revival. Instead, the whole thing was a fiasco, by what I heard. They was throwing firecrackers at him as he was trying to preach. Then when the meeting was over, they assaulted him in the parking lot and used the banner to give him a blanket tossing. That was one dangerous youth group. Pretty typical youth group by today's standards. I stayed in touch with him for a few years after he left, said Deacon Fred. Last I heard, he was living in his parish basement writing a book about the apostate church. He couldn't understand why publishers didn't want it. I didn't have the heart to tell them that there's a million unemployed seminary graduates living in their parents' basements and writing books against the organized religion. It was Luther that made old Jimmy's butter slip off his noodle, said the country preacher. Maybe it was part my fault. I kept sending him back to the battlefield. I said, if thou hast run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, what wilt thou do in the day of the horsemen? If you can't handle a room full of psychotic teenagers, then you ain't tough enough to be a gospel preacher. I just wanted to see him earn his sergeant stripes, but he ain't make it. One day after Sunday school, he comes crashing into my office. His face was all blackened and his hair was standing straight up and his clothes was half blown off. 
Who knows what the story was behind that? He says, I quit. He says, I hope you and Luther Buckenstein have a happy life together. Luther would sneak into the charismatic Baptist Bible tabernacle at night through a basement window. He rigged hymnals with pull-string firecrackers. He assiduously superglued every page of the preacher's Bible together. When a visiting gospel band finished rehearsing, he stole on stage and turned the drum machine up to 200 beats per minute. When the children's ministries built a nativity scene on the church lawn, he burned it down. He once caught a bird, tied a string to its tail, attached a sign that said, Eat it, Joe's, and let it loose during the church service. He let the air out of Jimmy Bavaca's tires, threw a cherry bomb in the toilet stall while Jimmy was in it, and many other such acts of terror he perpetrated. Luther Buckstein, said Deacon Elmer. I nearly forgot about that poor nut. I wonder what ever became of him. But you'll be grateful to know that Luther does not come into this story, and you will not be obliged to learn of what became of him. Speaking of nut jobs, said the country preacher, there's a new false prophet on the radio. I'm one of my stations, if you please. Based in Dogwood Park up yon Atlanta Way, a real corker. I plan to invite him to the courtroom. The courtroom nodded the elders. Good evening, mad men, mad women, and mad babies, said Meister Puck. I shall not be here for Sunday service. I have grim business elsewhere. A most august country parson has challenged me to a doctrinal debate in his Dunker Church of Five Points, that ancient renowned center of theological learning. I gleefully accept the challenge, though it is certain that the invitation was not extended with my edification in view. He wishes to hold me forth as a specimen of heresy. None could be more ideally suited for the role than I. I walk into this trap with both eyes open and will walk out of it with both pockets bulging. I asked Reverend Von Von Howitzer, or whatever his name is, to fill in for me, but he has not responded, so Archibald will be my pulpiteer on Sunday. Boo! A chorus of boos. I hope to make short shrift of business in five points and perhaps be back in time to catch the end of our most solemn worship service. On Saturday, Puck sent Sergeant Bunch to Marvin Aker's poultry farm with orders to come back with one dead chicken unplucked. He informed me that he and I would be running a covert mission to Five Points that night. We made the midnight drive in a van specifically designed to transport Meister Puck. It had tinted windows and a sofa and a mini fridge in the back. We arrived at the charismatic Baptist Bible Tabernacle and parked in a grassy lot next door. Wait here, said Puck and made off through the trees with a small sledge, a railroad spike, and the chicken. He returned in a moment with only the sledge. What is this, I said. I know my business, he said. He often said that. We returned next morning an hour early by design and found the country preacher, the elders, and the church organist and their wives gathered before the front steps, gawking at the chicken that had been nailed to the church doors. Meister Puck got out of the van and strode forward like a man who meant business. He raised his hand towards the chicken and bellowed, I canceled the demonic forces that have been summoned against this place of worship. I bind the powers of darkness and forbid them to transfer, act upon, or exit this chicken until I have commanded them. I claim a hedge of angelic swords around this place and those who gather here. Amen. He turned to the faithful and said, well, I hope you do not mind me putting myself forward as an advisor, he said, but I have extensive experience as a diabologist, deliverance minister, and spiritual warfare consultant, and this, I can tell you, is the work of Satanists. This chicken is a black magic talisman, which they call the Quariabantic Fowl. They perform a satanic rite over the ritually prepared chicken. A legion of demons enters the bird, and it goes into a frenzy and then falls dead from exhaustion. They place the bird on an altar surrounded by black tapered candles, anoint it with payback oil, and then deliver it to the target site. It must be nailed to the door with the spike that has been embedded in a dead oak for 13 months. Now the chicken is one of the undead. Its natural life is departed and it's inhabited by evil spirits. If it's removed from the door without the correct procedure, it becomes animated and, well, uh, some things are best not spoken about in the light of mourning. But the gist of the thing is that the bird is a talisman, or what Satanists call a Baphometic curse fulcrum, and it's the linchpin of the demonic forces that have been summoned against us. I have bound the powers of darkness, and now we must destroy the chicken by fire. I trust that, like any domesticated church, you have a fire pit out back and a store of firewood? 
You may wonder how anyone, however unsophisticated, could fall for such nonsense presented in such an officious manner. There was more to it than Puck's massive girth and uncannily bright eyes. He emitted an extremely powerful levitational field. The ancient science of alchemy, of which Puck was a master practitioner, posits gravity and levity as opposing forces of nature. Levity is not opposite of gravity in the sense that it repels rather than attracts. Both attract, one to darkness and heaviness and the other to light and lightness. Both fields are created by extremely dense concentrations of energy. Puck wielded an enormously powerful levitational field. To be in his presence was to be in his power. It was only after he departed that his subjects realized that they had been fed a loaf of baloney. Worville, he said to me, see if we have any liquid combustibles in the van and bring a hammer and pry bar. He turned back to the others and said, we will form a ring of prayer around the chicken as it is consumed and send the demonic forces back to the abyss whence they came. Let anyone who is experienced in these matters come along, but let there be no curiosity seekers, please. This is not a game. I returned from the van with the request of Desiderata. Maester Puck removed the accursed chicken and led the prayer warriors to the fire pit in the field behind the church. There was a pause in the grim procession when I stepped on the country preacher's heel and pulled his loafer off. He snugged his shoe back on and the stern march continued. Meister Puck expertly laid out kindling and firewood. I handed him a bottle of charcoal starter. He squeezed nearly the entire contents down the chicken's gullet, and then I handed him a can of car-starting ether. Even better, he said. He put the nozzle to the chicken's beak and pumped it full of ether until it was roughly the size and shape of a beach ball. He tied the chicken's neck in a knot, plugged its rear end with a cork, carefully set it on top of the firewood, and doused the pyre with the remaining charcoal fluid. He flicked matches until one hit and the pyre burst into flames. The flames burned red. The reek of smoldering feathers filled the air. The flames turned yellow. The chicken began to rumble. The flames whirled and burned blue. The cork popped and the chicken launched, shot high in the air, and exploded over five points in a deafening blast. Hallelujah, shouted Meister Puck, but no one echoed this ejaculation, for we were all scampering away to escape the rain of incendiary feathers that now descended from the chicken's point of dispatchment. Thus, the forces of darkness were routed. What, you find this story improbable? Discreet reader, the longer one wears the spectacles of scientific skepticism on one's nose, the shorter one's vision becomes. To travel with Meister Puck is to travel that outer boundary where everything possible to be believed is an image of truth, and where religious nuts and loonies see farther than the wise and prudent. This is the boundary from which the prophet Daniel and John the Revelator brought back their apocalyptic visions. And since Meister Puck was the last prophet, might not the happenings surrounding his activities give us a premonition of what will befall our world at the end of the age? And can anyone familiar with the ways and values of the 21st century dismiss the possibility that the world will end in a screwball comedy? After the successful conclusion of the Coriobantic Chicken Exorcism Rite, the country preacher went inside for a moment. Apparently separating himself from Puck broke the levitational spell. He came back outside and took Meister Puck aside for a quiet word. Meister Puck returned to me and said, The preacher has canceled our debate. My work here is done. Let us return to the Battle of Armageddon's Southern Command Bunker. He got into the van and said, Thus is the spirit of gravity exercised. The country preacher took the pulpit and announced that that morning's debate had been canceled because my opponent is crazier than an outhouse rat. The preacher had no understanding of the hidden forces. Little did he know that the exploding chicken ceremony was a rite of hilariation, the efficacy of which I can testify is beyond question. I know my business, said Meister Puck. 